Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so uh, I'll just remind you where we were at. We're uh, in the course of uh, studying the diameter of the mean field minimum spanning tree. So uh, just a quick recap of where we got to last lecture. Uh, so, uh, so the setting uh, last lecture and throughout this one is the complete graph with IID uniform zero one edge weights. Um, and then we wrote MSTN for the resulting minimum spanning tree. Right, and uh, then we defined FNP to be the forest, which, which was the minimum spanning forest of uh, of GNP. So if you like that, right, this is what, um, this is the, the forest built by Kruskal's algorithm coupled to the erdos renyi graph process. Um, and then our goal uh, is to prove that the diameter of this minimum spanning tree is of order n to the third in probability. So what we'd seen so far is that if I so I'm going to give myself a bit of uh, notation, which I didn't use uh, last lecture, but which I'll use uh, quite a bit today. So if I write um, H epsilon for the largest uh, connected component of the graph, um, GN one plus epsilon over N and, um, and T epsilon for its uh, minimum spanning tree. All right, so this is, whoops. Um, this is the um, the component of the minimum spanning forest, uh, which has the same vertex set as H epsilon, right? So this is this is going to be a subtree of the eventual minimum spanning tree. Then uh, then we saw that um, if epsilon is zero, so so that's in just the, the perfectly critical uh, random graph G n one over n then uh, we saw a lower bound on the diameter. Uh, so um, the probability that the diameter of the minimum spanning tree is small, say at most uh, n to the third over k, well, that's at most. In order for the minimum spanning tree, tree to be small, the tree T0 has to be small because that's a subtree of the minimum spanning tree. Uh, so that's at most the probability of the diameter of T zero is at most into the third over K. And that's less than Delta, right? Where this, we, for this bound, we used our understanding of the structure of a critical random graph. Uh, as a, roughly speaking, a, a sort of something that looks quite a bit like a tree of size of order into the two thirds with a small number of bounded in probability number of surplus edges. Okay, and then also, uh, uh, you know, I, I left you with um, with a, a way to start to think about upper bounds on the diameter of T naught in terms of the diameter of the <coughs> corresponding component of the uh, of the critical random graph. So that was this exercise that uh, um, that said uh, that if I take some graph H and add an edge U V to it then that's, uh, that can't cause the diameter basically to go down by more than a factor two. Okay, um, so using that, uh, you can prove that uh, just by repeatedly applying that, thinking about deleting a sequence of edges. So, uh, you know, if H has sur surplus S and T is a spanning tree of S, then the diameter of the tree is less than say uh, three to the S times the diameter of the, of the graph. Okay, I think probably you can put two to the, two to the S here, but um, three is certainly safe, right? So the idea is just each, roughly speaking, each, you know, each you, if you take this graph, which has some number S of surplus edges, 
each time you remove a surplus edge, you can, you sort of roughly can, in the worst case, double the diameter. So when you remove S surplus edges, you shouldn't make the surplus go up by more than a factor of about two to the S. Okay, so that implies that uh, if we look at the diameter of the, this component of the minimum uh, spanning forest T naught, right, the largest tree in the spanning forest at criticality, that's a most two to the surplus of H or three to the surplus, I guess I'm using three here, of H naught times the diameter of H naught. Okay, but we know that, um, we know that, uh, that this surplus, we've seen that this surplus is order one in probability. And we've seen that the diameter of a component of bounded surplus is of order uh, square root of its size in probability. Okay, which is, um, uh, sorry, there should be a square root there. Right, and, the, and the, these critical components have size of order n to the two thirds. So this is um, order n to the third in probability. So here we have an upper bound, which is, you know, something of order into the third times something of order one. Uh, and so overall we get an upper bound of order n to the third, just on the component of, the, uh, just on the diameter of this particular tree. Right, so that doesn't give us a bound on the diameter of the whole, upper bound on the diameter of the whole minimum spanning tree, because this is, you know, this inclusion goes the wrong way. Um, we're going to have to work harder to get a, a bound on the whole minimum spanning tree. Um, but it's at least a, a, a first step. Okay, and we can actually do a little bit better than just looking at the diameter at epsilon equals zero, because we, we, we learned a little bit, we learned about the sort of structure of the, um, of the critical random graph, not just at one over n, but in a window around one over n, where we took epsilon to be a, the form constant over n to the third. Then we saw um, this picture of the excursions as coded by a reflected Brownian motion, uh, which was telling us that, in fact, the largest components stay of order into the one third all throughout that window. Okay, so um, so we can extend this result a little bit. Um, you know, we can in fact prove that for um, any constant in R, then if we look at the diameter of the tree T C over n to the third, right? So this is the, um, just to reinforce, this is the, uh, the minimum spanning tree of H C over n to the third, which is the, the largest component of G n one plus C on n to the third over n. Okay, so the diameter of this um, subtree of the eventual MST is also of order n to the third in probability. Okay, and the proof of that is no different from the proof that uh, that we just did, because for any for any c, so we, you know we, we just did the proof in the case c is zero, but for any c in this range, you know with, if epsilon is c on n to the third, then we then we we know that the diameter of uh, of h epsilon is of order the square root of its size. So that's still of order n to the third. And a surplus of h epsilon is still of order one. Okay, and so, uh, uh, so this bound that the diameter of t epsilon is at most three to the surplus of uh, H epsilon times the diameter of H epsilon. Uh, uh, gives, this, gives this upper bound here. This term is order one in probability and this term is order into the third in probability. Okay, so, um, you know, the quality of this bound, I'm hiding, there's a dependence on C in this bound, right? It's not the case that for any C, the diameter is sort of uniformly of, uh, of order, uh, well, um, the, 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 size of, um, the size of this component is uniformly of order n to the two thirds. We know that if C tends to infinity, then the size of the largest component starts to be larger than to the two thirds. Okay, but for any fixed C in this range, we have this bound. And so then the hope is that we can use this 
um, to you know get from we'll, we'll we'll try to start at some large constant c and somehow show that after that large time the diameter shouldn't increase or that that large value the diameter shouldn't increase very much so the strategy then uh, strategy now is going to be to um, well we'll proceed in two steps so one is to bound the difference between what happens at um, so we know we can get up to epsilon a sort of large constant over n to the third. Um, so we'll try to get from there all the way up to epsilon just a small constant. Uh, so t k over n to the third. So you, um, so for some k large. Right. So this is going from this corresponds to the this is this is the largest. The, the tree in the forest uh, corresponding to, so F N and then P is one plus K on N to the third over N. And, and here we're all the way up at F N one plus one over K on N. Okay, so <clears throat> here we're still with, within the critical window though almost at the end of it. And here we're practically at one plus constant over N. Right? It's a small constant, but constant over n. Okay, so that's so we'll, we'll do that'll be one step. That's actually going to be the sort of um, harder step. And then the second step, which is easier, and I'll actually do first, is to is to figure out what happens uh, when we go from you know this barely supercritical range uh, all the way up to the final MST. So the difference between the minimum diameter of the minimum spanning tree and the diameter of um, of t one over k. Okay, so is the is the sort of picture of the uh, of the proof clear? Any questions? <clears throat> okay, so this is so this is um, this is what we're aiming for. We want to uh, sort of grow from. You know, thinking of the probability as time, then we're trying to sort of watch the process over time, saying we know that the process hasn't grown a tree of diameter bigger than to the third at this time. Now we need to uh, watch for the remainder of the uh, of time and see that the diameter doesn't increase beyond that threshold that we're aiming for. Okay, so let's do this. Um, what I said, this this uh, this second step first. Um, so, uh, so that's proving an upper bound on the diameter of the minimum spanning tree uh, minus the diameter of T epsilon. And here I'm thinking now of, so epsilon is my one over K. So that's for epsilon uh, fixed. And you can think of it as small. Okay, so, um, so I'll show you that. Um, so for this, for the, um, you know, in, in this regime, so for epsilon fixed, this difference here is in fact polylogarithmically small. So um, this is at most log squared n. Okay, so that's our target, and uh, we're going to prove this. Um, by analyzing uh, a sort of variant of Prim's algorithm. Okay, so I want to I want to think about conditioning on the graph. Uh, you know, I'm interested in understanding the diameter increase between uh, between this between um, time t epsilon. So here we're sort of sitting in f n one plus epsilon over n. Uh, or gn one plus epsilon over n, and and so what happens after this time going up to time one? So I want to condition on the structure at this time, okay, and then um, do my analysis conditional on the structure. So let's write. Um, let me sort of. Uh, um, well, let me write that down. So we're going to condition on gn one plus epsilon over n, and then. Uh, and then uh, run Prim's algorithm from a from an arbitrary starting vertex. So, OK, 
Okay, so the picture to have in mind, now we're sitting in this sort of supercritical random graph, is that the largest component, remember we called that H epsilon, is some large, is occupying some large macroscopic um, section of the graph. Okay, so the size of, we, we think that the size of this H epsilon should be, you know, roughly uh, uh, like n times theta of, uh, of uh, one plus epsilon, right? So some, uh, some potentially small but constant proportion of the graph. And then the other components of this graph are all sort of quite small pieces. They're just, there's just some sort of dust hanging out over here. Okay, and then sitting inside of this, there's some minimum spanning trees, if you like, the forest F on each of these. Okay, so this is the, this is the kind of schematic picture of, of the graph at this point. Okay, and, um, and what I'd like to do is say, uh, you know, I can bound the, the increase in the diameter between time epsilon and the final graph by thinking about, well, if Prim's algorithm, you know, hops through five components before it gets to the, um, the, the giant component, then that builds a path. And the longest possible length of that path is five times how the, the largest, whatever the largest size of any of these components is. You know, if none of the components it goes through has size bigger than 100, and it only makes five steps, then the then five then five times 100 is an upper bound on the on the diameter increase, sort of due to that particular path. So if I can just show that no matter where Prim's algorithm starts, it's not gonna it's not very likely to build a very long path. Then I can use that as an overall diameter uh, uh, bound on the diameter increase. Okay, so let me um, to formalize that. Let me let me write. Um, JV for the number of um, components that pr that Prim's algorithm goes through if we start at vertex V until it gets um, until it gets to H epsilon. Okay, so this is um, uh, the number of uh, components of F n one plus epsilon on n visited by Prim's algorithm. starting from V and before visiting or before reaching uh, T, T epsilon. Right, this, um, this spanning tree of H epsilon over here is T epsilon, right? Uh, so then um, I can bound, you know, with that, defi with that definition, um, I can bound the difference that I'm trying to bound by, um, so the largest of these JV plus one times the largest size of any component other than, uh, uh, other than the giant. So, um, the largest um, size of C such that, um, so C is a component of, uh, of G and one plus epsilon over N, which is different from uh, the, the largest component, right? So where does this bound come from? This is just because if I take uh, any path you know, from, you know, the, the diameter, the, I, I guess I need, um, I guess I need a two in front of this. So the point is that um, how can the diameter, um, you know, how different from the diameter of this graph can the diameter of the whole graph be? Well, in the worst case, a path, you know, a path, the, the diameter could be increased because now we could build some path which jumps through some components of, uh, of, uh, uh, some of these small components, then it joins itself into the um, uh, into the largest component. Okay, then it follows some path in the largest component, and then it uh, and then it leaves uh, and and creates another path outside of the largest component. Okay, so each of these paths, you know, 
could in principle, well, I'm adding, I'm this, I'm adding this plus one for each of these, uh, these sort of connective edges, but maybe, maybe there's actually a minus one from the interior. The point is that, you know, if I, if I bound the length of sort of traveling through a component plus leaving the component by the largest size of a component plus one, then that gives me a, then, then sort of this term counts, uh, the contribution from any root through a component plus leaving. And then, um, Oh, sorry. Um, no, I said that wrong. Uh, uh, this is this is this is here. I'm counting the largest size of any of these components. So the length of of a path that goes through a component and then leaves uh, is at most this term here. Okay, because um, you know if a component has ten vertices, then a path through it has at most nine edges plus the edge that uh, that you leave by. Uh, uh, gives you, you know, a mo a most a contribution of 10 edges from a component with 10 vertices. So each component like this, um, so, so each component gives you a contribution which is at most this largest size of any non-giant component. Um, and the number of those you can get is at most um, sort of, uh, well, some number starting from one end here, some number leaving from the other end there, and an upper bound on each of those is this number the number of components visited by Prim's algorithm before you reach the, the final graph. Okay, and uh, so maybe I don't even need this um, this plus one here. Okay, um, so uh, so what I'd like to do now, right? So the goal is to prove that um, after time h epsilon, the diameter uh, increase is at most log squared n. So I just I, I can just show you that each of these terms is at most order log n in probability, and that will give me my upper bound. Okay, so, um, so the proposition follows if, you know, let me call this one and this two, if one and two are both order log n in probability. Okay, well, we've already seen um, one of those facts, uh, you know. Uh, we already saw that the, the largest non-giant component is order log n in probability. All right, I showed you a weaker, a weaker bound uh, first, uh, but then we said that by um, sort of comparison with a, um, with a subcritical branching process, all the components of, um, all the non-giant components of, uh, of a supercritical random graph actually look subcritical. Okay, so this is, um, uh, th this is, um, you know, that's known from, um, from our study of the erdos renyi random graph, right? And maybe I'll say a little bit more about that because I'm gonna kind of, um, I'm gonna use it, use this sort of thing in a bit more detail later. Okay, so, you know, you know, more precisely, you know, we saw that after exploring uh, H epsilon, what remains looks like, um, you know, G N prime one plus epsilon over N where n prime is like um, n times one minus theta of one plus epsilon. Um, and uh, this graph looks roughly like, uh, so if you sort of rewrite this probability um, in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of n prime, and let me just write lambda for the moment as one plus epsilon, then this looks like uh, gn prime lambda hat over n prime, where lambda hat is the dual parameter to lambda, and this is a subcritical random graph. Okay, so that's um, uh, that's sort of one way to um, to see that um, that the the other components are all logarith logarithmic in size. Okay, and so I want to, you know, really focus on on this first term. Uh, so, um, so then it, um, you know, given that it remains to 
to show that. Um, so we want this quantity here to be order log n in probability. Okay, and remember, so j, what's j again? j is the number of hops. So if you sort of run Prim's algorithm, but you only count the steps which go between components before you reach h epsilon, j is the number of such hops, right? And then we're looking at, we're maximizing that over all components. Okay, so, um, so let's, um, uh, let's analyze that now, right? So let's think about what happens um, when we add an edge that's not in, within one of these components. So remember, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, I, I'm thinking of fixing You know, fixing the the structure of this graph um, here, and then running Prim's algorithm, right? Well, starting from you know, in this in this example that I've just drawn, where the the component containing V is just a vertex, right? So the first edge that it adds will be is the smallest weight edge leaving V. It's uniformly random among all. It'll, you know, the smallest weight edge is uniformly random over the whole graph, right? Uh, so it's so the probability that it hits h epsilon is just the size of h epsilon over n minus one. Okay, so that's the first step. You know, maybe we don't get lucky. V goes over here, and uh, and does some uh, some exploration. Okay. Well, now at some point we well we know in fact what we'll explore. We'll exhaust the exploration of the spanning tree of this component, and then we'll add an edge to the rest of the graph. Okay. Now where will that uh, that next edge go? Well, um, you know, in this, it's not going to go to V. V's already been spanned. So it has probability, you know, size of H epsilon over everything that's left of connecting to H epsilon. Okay. And, you know, if we don't get lucky again, then, you know, maybe we, uh, you know, we add an edge over here and explore this component. And now we, um, you know, when we have exhausted that, we have to leave this component. And at every step, right, all, all that we know, um, uh, well, maybe there's something, there's something more to say here. It's at, at this moment in, in, in principle, you know, Prim's algorithm has the smallest weight edge that's available to it. So the edge is not equal, the edge is not equally likely to emanate from any of these vertices, right? When we added, when we added this edge, it was the smallest weight edge leaving V, you know, so if it had weight, if we were really unlucky and it had weight a half, then now we know that all of the other edges leaving V have weight bigger than a half. Okay. And so if there's, you know, if, if all the, if all we know about the edges leaving here is that they're at most one plus epsilon over N, then it's far more likely that the next edge leaving, um, leaving the exploration leaves from this component rather than leaving from V. And more generally, you know, whatever's added earlier by Prim's algorithm, we learn more about it's the edge weights leaving that section. So, you know, when, we, when this edge was added, it was the smallest weight edge leaving all of this section. So now we know that all of the edges leaving this section of the exploration are bigger than the weight of this edge. Whereas we don't have such information about this component. So the next edge, you know, after we explore these three components, the next edge is more likely to leave from here than it is from back here, okay? But where it goes is it continues to be uniformly random. We don't have any information about the stuff that's outside of what we've explored so far. So no matter where we leave from, where we leave to is a uniformly random vertex of what's left. That's the key point. Okay, so each time we finish an expo exploring a component, we have chance size of H epsilon over whatever size is left of joining up to H epsilon. Okay, so let me, um, let me write that down. I think I've explained it in words enough now. Um, so each time uh, Prim's algorithm adds an edge not in uh, Fn one plus epsilon on n, it has probability at least, so h epsilon uh, over n minus one of connecting to T epsilon, if it hasn't already.
and that's just because although where it, where it connects from might not be uniformly random over what over the tree that's built so far where it connects to is always uniformly random uh, over uh, what remains to be connected okay so that means that um, you know if we condition on the structure of the of fn1 plus epsilon or of gn1 plus epsilon so um, conditionally given uh, gn plus epsilon on n, you know, the, the number of the number of hops we have to do until we hit this uh, big component, well, at each at each hop, we have, uh, you know, success probability bigger than h, h epsilon on n of succeeding. So that so that number of hops jv is stochastically dominated by a geometric random variable with success probability h epsilon divided by n. Okay, but now, um, you know, since uh, we know that the size of H epsilon is like, uh, well, we proved a, a law of large numbers for that. It's n theta of one plus epsilon. Then this upper bound, you know, this is basically like, well, n one plus epsilon on n. So geometric with success probability theta of one plus epsilon. And we're thinking of epsilon as a constant. So this success probability is just a constant. Right, so it's a geometric with constant parameter. So this uh, this upper bound is order one in probability. Okay, and so that means now uh, that uh, you know the probability that the largest of these is bigger than k log n. You know, using this, I'm going to use this stochastic uh, relation now to, to bound um, the maximum and not just a single term. So I have to be a little bit more careful just because one of them is going to be order one doesn't mean the biggest is going to be of order one, right? But I can say that that's at most, you know, I want to, I want to argue conditionally on this structure. So the bad news is if H epsilon for some reason is much smaller than it should be because then my geometric bound gets bad. Okay, so um, if I'm unlucky and the largest component is less than half of the size it should be, then I'll, then, th then, th then I'll say that's bad news, but we know by the law of large numbers, that's unlikely. And then uh, in the good news situation <coughs> where that um, size is, is not too much smaller than it's supposed to be. Um, so I, I'll write, you know, for that term, we bound this by the probability that the maximum is bigger than K log N given that the giant has size bigger than half its expected value. Okay. And the first term is little o one by the law of large numbers. And the second term is, so just by union bound, n times the probability that one of these uh, terms is bigger than k log n given this, which is just the probability that a geometric with success parameter uh, theta one plus epsilon on two takes value bigger than, than k log n, right? So I'm just uh, here using union bound over the vertices. And then for each vertex, I'm using this stochastic domination to get this upper bound. Okay, so, so here I have, um, you know, n, oh, that's a minus. I have n uh, and then some constant less than one to uh, constant log n. And so if K is large, then this whole thing tends to zero. Right, and so that shows that um, the maximum is indeed uh, order log N in probability. Okay, so those are, th that, those are the two steps we needed. The number, of, the number of hops isn't more than logarithmic and each hop takes no, no more than a logarithmic number of steps. So we get an overall bound of, of log squared n on the diameter increase. Okay. Um, right. So that says, you know, there's something interesting about, uh, I mean, the proof of this isn't, uh, isn't very hard once you sort of have the idea of using Prim's algorithm. But there is something uh, that's worth remarking on here. You know, uh, this this component here, you know, epsilon can be as small as you like. So this component here can contain 1% of the vertices of the, of the eventual spanning tree, right? 
But this result is telling you that it's already really determined the global geometric structure of the, of the minimum spanning tree. All that's left is sort of addition of mass onto it. It's not about, which doesn't really change its geometry. This thing is gonna have you know, we know that this thing has a diameter of at least order n to the third, and now we're adding on some paths of polylogarithmic length. That really doesn't change the metric picture very much, only the measured picture, if you count, if you think about the, 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 ver the vertex additions as, as adding mass, as changing the measure of the thing. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's the, uh, uh, that's the first of two steps. Okay, well, the second of three, if you like. I mean, the first one was to say that at time constant over n to the third, the diameter was still order n to the third. Now we've said that once the time is some small positive constant, the diameter doesn't change very much. And now we need to go between those two steps. And that's what the rest of the lecture will be about. Okay. So, um, so we're going to, um, at a high level, what we're going to do is um, is sort of go through that, break that jump from constant over n to the third to small positive constant up into pieces, and bound the diameter increase on each of those pieces, and show that those that that, that the bounds are so we'll prove bounds that are geometrically decaying, so that they're summable. That's the that's the plan, okay? But the way and the way that we're going to um, to do that is is by stepping through, the, so increasing time in increments so that um, sort of um, in each increase, some new, um, some new pieces will get glued on, okay? And, uh, and then that will cause the giant component to look even bigger and what's left look even smaller. And so that's, uh, you know, the fact that each time new stuff gets glued on, it makes, the giant look more supercritical and what's left look more subcritical is why you can hope for a sort of geometric bound. Okay, so the, um, the I'll get to sort of um, to formalizing how we'll, we step through in just a sec, but there's sort of one more, um, there, there's sort of, because we need to control the diameter increase when these new pieces glue on and the new pieces that are gluing on are always coming from what sort of looks like a subcritical graph. It's the part of this supercritical graph after you remove the giant. I just need to state a fact about um, the behavior of diameters and subcritical facts, which is sort of a slight extension of what we saw in the um, in in studying random graphs. Um, but it shouldn't feel too unfamiliar given what we've already seen. So I'll give you a sort of proof sketch of this, not full details, but I think that um, uh, it should be convincing given what we've seen already. So this is uh, a sort of preparatory fact for the for that step A of the that remains in the proof. So we're looking at um, the setting where, um, so epsilon over n to the third tends to infinity uh, and epsilon is less than one. And I'm looking at a subcritical graph. So in Gn, one minus epsilon on n, then with high probability, so with probability tending to one, uh, two things happen. One is that, uh, so the largest component of, uh, so the large, sorry, the largest diameter of any component uh, is at most order, um, uh, so log of epsilon cubed n over epsilon. And the second fact is that the largest surplus of any component is order is not order one, is at most one with high probability. Okay. Uh, so I guess I can move this line here. So the first line uh, the, 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 there's no need for with high probability because the probability is sort of encapsulated in this uh, notation. Okay, so we're saying there's no component of bigger than um, of diameter bigger than a, than this polylog factor over epsilon, and there's no component uh, with more than one surplus edge in a subcritical random graph. 
Okay, so, um, so let me um, explain why these are true. So the ref, the, the, the step that, um, that, I, um, that I won't uh, sort of do in full detail, but I'll use uh, multiple times is that, so a component of diameter about, you know, K has size about K squared. So that, so this is somehow using that these components roughly have like quadratic volume growth, like, um, like random trees do. Okay, so we've seen, um, we've, we've never precisely proved this, but we've seen various facts that are closely related to this. And, um, and I'll sort of lean fairly heavily on this uh, throughout the proof. I mean, to the point where I'll say having, you know, I'll use as though it's equivalent in, in, in terms of events that if a component has size about S then it's, or size about M, then its diameter will be about square root of M. Okay, so you have that, that, I mean, the fact that those two things aren't literally equivalent, they just are typically equivalent, um, makes turning what I write into an actual proof a little bit more delicate because you have to control the errors in that sort of events that I'm describing. But if you're willing to sort of believe the story that these two things are, are roughly equivalent, then you can um, you can get the intuition for why the fact is true quite quite easily. Okay, so um, so uh, so we're focusing now in in this graph g n one minus epsilon over n. Uh, so what's the probability that the diameter of a component is bigger than k? So right away we'll use this. Um, this um, sort of heuristic that we didn't prove, say this is roughly the probability that the component has size bigger than k squared. Okay, and now um, just using the coupling with um, with um, Poisson bien aimé, we know that that's like uh, at most the probability that so a Poisson one minus epsilon bien aimé tree has a size bigger than k squared. And uh, and so you know I'll we we've we've seen up we've seen a bound on this term but let me use that in a second let me um, for the moment just treat this as as a bound uh, use it to derive a bound on the expected number of components of large diameter and then and then use our um, what we know about how these probabilities decay so that tells me the expected number of components of diameter bigger than k. Well, each, you know, if each, if each such component has about k squared vertices, then the number of components of this size is about k squared smaller, or sorry, the number of components of this diameter is about a factor k squared smaller than the number of vertices in those components, because each component will have about k squared uh, vertices. Okay, so this is at most roughly um, uh, one over k squared times the expected number of vertices that are that that are in components of size of, of size bigger than k squared. Okay, and now our, our bound says that that's at most roughly so linearity of expectation and over k squared times the probability that one uh, vertex is in such a large component. Um, so, uh, so now what do we know about, um, about this, this bound on the right? Well, we saw that, um, you know, the probability that, um, that a subcritical BNMA tree like this has size bigger than X on epsilon squared was like order one on, uh, X on epsilon squared to the half e to the minus x on two, okay? Just using, uh, you know, Sterling's formula basically, and then approximating the sum by a Riemann integral, right? And so then if we take uh, k to be this x on epsilon squared to the half, okay? Then this tells us um, that, you know, so the expected number of components there should be a 
number in there. Uh, so the expected number of components of diameter bigger than uh, x on epsilon squared. Uh, sorry, um, uh, this is a k and not a k squared. So diameter x on epsilon squared to the half, which is what x to the half on epsilon is. So order one, then we have n over k squared. Um, so x on epsilon squared. And then we have this, uh, this upper bound here. So that gives us an extra um, x on epsilon squared to the half, and then e to the minus x on two. So let me just rearrange that. Uh, here we have a one on epsilon cubed on the bottom. So that's n epsilon cubed over uh, x to the half e to the minus x on two uh, with an order one. Okay, so, so this, so up to this heuristic that having diameter bigger than k is roughly the same as having size bigger than k squared, we've derived a upper bound on the expected number of components of diameter bigger than sort of something over epsilon. And what do we have to do over here to get a good bound? We need to cancel this n epsilon cubed, right? So taking x to be like a log of order log n epsilon cubed is precisely what's uh, what's needed uh, to to get a small to get a small bound here, okay, and that's what um, that's the sort of upper bound we stated. So we have the one on, one on epsilon here, and then we have to take x large enough to uh, to cancel this um, so that this this here is like little o one. So maybe I could even even have written a, a a half right there. I think I could have, um, but I don't need uh, I don't need better than this. Okay, so that's the first, uh, that's the sort of intuition for the first step. Um, for the second, um, the ideas are sort of similar. Um, they're maybe a little bit easier, uh, but let me, um, let me go through it. So we're again, we're gonna continue to use um, the bound on, uh, on, uh, so the upper bound on a component size, but we don't need this. This is just a statement about surplus um, and not about diameter. So we don't need we don't need this heuristic anymore. Okay, but I will use a slightly different heuristic, which is that. Um, so um, so I'll use that um, a component of size. Whoops, of size k has surplus which is roughly like a binomial k to the three halves one over n or roughly a Poisson k to the three halves over n. Okay, and this is, um, you know, I owe you a explanation of this as well. The rough idea is what comes from the exploration process perspective on, on these components, right? We saw that, um, so when you explore a component you, uh, you have this queue of active vertices, right? And um, at any given time, at any given step, there are some edges that you could add or, or leave out, um, which are the surplus edges, which don't change the sort of depth for search tree that you build. Okay, and the discrete area under this curve is precisely the number of, the, of potential locations for surplus edges, right? So the you know, when, when we build a tree T, the potential number of surplus edges was the area under the, uh, under the excursion for T, which, you know, which we sort of wrote area of T. And, uh, and this statement here is really just that this area is roughly the size of T to the three halves, um, because this excursion looks roughly like a random walk. So if it has length K, then it will have sort of typical height of order square root K. Okay, so the so this, when this length is k, then the, the sort of typical height of the excursion is k to the half. So the total area under the excursion will be like k to the three halves, and that's telling you the number of possible places for surplus edges. And each of those shows up with probability about one over n. Okay, so, um, so in particular, um, uh, 
you know, if k to the three halves over n is much smaller than one, then, uh, you know, the probability that a component of size k has surplus at least two, well, this is, uh, you know, now roughly like um, the probability that a Poisson k to the three halves on n is at least two, which is, well, when, so, you know, the easiest way, if this, if this parameter is small, then this is, uh, you know, the, the easiest way to, ha to have value at least two is to have value exactly two, and that probability is like, um, just the, the parameter squared. So the probability that Poisson k to the three halves on n is equal to two, which is uh, what? A half k to the three halves on n squared. Okay, so, um, so that's, uh, so it's just the, this order of magnitude for the probability that a component of size k has surplus at least two that I'm gonna use now. Okay, so let's just use that to do a sort of rough calculation of the expected number of components of, uh, let's say, size in some interval, some dyadic interval k to k and surplus bigger than one. Okay, well, again, so for each component of, you know, I can, I can count components or I can count vertices in those components and there's a factor k or between k and 2k that relates them. So that's roughly like one over k times the expected number of vertices that have uh, component size between k and 2k and surplus bigger than one. Okay. Um, and now, so that's like um, uh, at most like n over k and using our Poisson bound again times the probability that uh, Poisson one minus epsilon bien aimé tree has size uh, uh, say greater than or equal to k. Okay. And let's just bound this by, um, by one on k to the half. Uh, oh, and sorry, um, and then we still need uh, uh, times the, the probability that this um, Poisson um, k to the three halves on n is bigger than one. Okay, so I'm just saying, uh, so the n here comes from linearity of expectation to focus on a single vertex rather than all n vertices. And then I'm saying, uh, you know, if one if one vertex is going to have this, the probability one vertex has this size, we can bound by what the component of a single vertex has this size, we can bound by this probability. And then given that it has this size, the probability its surplus is bigger than one, uh, we, we bound using the argument we just saw. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, you know, this probability is at most like one on k to the half. That's, um, you know, we can even put one instead of one minus epsilon here. And that's still true, okay? Um, and now for this probability, we have a k to the three halves on, uh, on n all squared. And so, you know, this term, well, one of these two terms cancels with this term. And so the whole bound we get is like um, uh, k to the three halves on n. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this is a good bound if k to the three halves is much smaller than n, right? But now um, we know that in, in um, you know, when, uh, what re regime are we were focused on? We're in the subcritical regime. Okay, so the largest component size here is little o of n to the two thirds. So we only have to look at components of size much smaller than n to the two thirds in order to prove the fact because there are no bigger com components. Okay, so now um, if we just, um, so now we, we can sum this bound. Well, what's in this regime, we know that the largest component, um, so the largest component 
overall has size uh, at most. Uh, uh, so the bound we saw was uh, log epsilon cubed n over epsilon squared, which is little o of n to the two thirds. Okay, so now you can uh, you can sum this bound. Over so the reason we did these dyadic intervals is so that we can sum it over k of the form two to the i, where two to the i is now at most um, uh, you know our bound here. Okay, and so the even even at the very largest value of k here, the contribution here is a little o of one. Okay, and then as k decreases from the maximal value, uh, the expected number geometrically decreases. So the sum overall is little o of one. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so the total expected number of components uh, of surplus greater than one is little o of one. Okay, so that's, um, uh, I hope, you know, that that step might have felt uh, a little bit hasty, but um, the, uh, the method here um, is, is um, really fairly straightforward. You just are, um, uh, well, I mean, up to this, uh, this heuristic, which, uh, which needs, which again is a step that, uh, that needs a little bit of justification. Um, but if you sort of believe this this approximation here, then the rest is uh, really follows quite straightforwardly. Okay, so this is the input we need about subcritical random graphs. We want to know that the um, we want to know that the, that the diameter of the pieces is small because these pieces are going to get glued on, and we don't want them to aggregate to increase the overall diameter very much as we increase through the critical window. Okay, and we want to know their surplus is small because um, the diameter of the component doesn't have to be the same as the diameter of its spanning tree, and the way we and we have a good bound on that as long as the surplus is small. So we actually got that the surplus is, is at most one. So we get a very good relation. I mean, the the diameter of the tree is sort of not more than double the diameter of the component. Okay. So so now um, so now I think we have the pieces we need, um, and I'll um, I'll move to uh, to this step. Um, step A here. Okay, so um, so I have a sort of uh, a sort of key lemma, which is the thing that gets that allows us to do um, one step of the. You know, I said we're going to. Um, uh, Split this increase up into into steps, and the lemma. This lemma is what we'll use um, to bound the increase in diameter at each step. Okay, so given the graph uh, G, I'll write um, L P of G for the longest uh, the long the length of the longest path in in G. So. Okay, so this could be this can be even longer than the diameter. It's just the the long you know you you're allowed to, it doesn't have to be a geodesic of any kind. You can take any path you like. And now we'll look at um, at graphs uh, g and g prime. So connected graphs with the same vertex set, uh, but where so g is a subgraph of g prime. Okay, and I'll look at, um, uh, actually, so these don't need to be connected, just graphs. Now I'll look at connected components of these graphs. So H and H prime be connected components of G and G prime. Okay, then I can bound the diameter of H prime from above by the diameter of H plus twice the length of the longest path uh, 
in the subgraph of G prime that I get by restricting to the vertices outside of H plus one. Okay, so this notation, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this notation. So, so when I write G of a set S, this means uh, the subgraph of G induced by uh, the vertex set S. So it says you take you take the this this is a subset of the vertices and you just take that subset of the vertices and all the edges. Okay, so um, so this lemma I think this lemma becomes easier to parse if I just show you uh, the the sort of picture of what's going on. Right. So here's um, uh, here's here's the picture. Um, this is. The graph G prime, this blob here, it has the same vertex set as G. And now H is a component of G, H prime is a component of G prime. And we're trying to bound the diameter of H prime in terms of the diameter of H plus the lo longest path in what's left if you remove H from this picture. Okay. So let's just um, let's just think about how you could build um, uh, well, how much the diameter of uh, could increase when you move from H to H prime. Okay, so for if we're given vertices uh, U1 and U2 in H prime, okay, so here's, you know, U1 and here's U2. Well, one way that we could build a path from U1 to U2, um, right, we, if we're trying to if we're trying to bound the diameter of H prime from above, it suffices to bound the length of the shortest path between any two vertices in H prime from above, because the diameter is just the longest such length, right? So I'll do that by just thinking about taking a path from U1 to H and a path from U2 to H, and then joining them up within H. Okay, so let's let, um, so P be a shortest path from uh, U1 to H, and I'll call its other end uh, V1, okay? And then, uh, so let's let uh, Q be a shortest path from U2 to H, and I'll call its other end V2. Um, the longest, there's a question, is LP the longest simple path? Yes, the longest simple path. You're not allowed to just go around and around and around a cycle. Um, uh, right, so here's um, the path. Uh, so this is P and this is Q. And then I'll let R be a shortest path from V1 to V2 in H. Okay, so here's R. Okay. Now, um, you know, if I call, um, that's not a very legible P. You know, if, if I call this quantity in, in the bound here L, right, then P has length at most L because it's, a, it's, it's some, it's some shortest path to H. So in particular, you know, if I, if I exclude its final edge, then it is some path in, in H prime minus H. So it's some path in this graph, right? The graph I get from G prime by excluding H. And so its length is at most the length of the longest path in, in that graph. And then I have to add one for the edge going into H. And likewise, this is some path in G prime when you remove H. So its length is at most the longest path in there. And then I add one. Okay, so, um, so then the length of, of P is at most L and the length of uh, Q is at most L. And the length of R, well, R is the shortest path between two vertices in H. So its length is at most the diameter of H. So when I put them together, uh, we get that uh, the distance in 
h prime between u1 and u2 is at most the diameter of h plus 2l. Okay, and since that's true for any vertices uh, in h prime, uh, it follows that the diameter of h prime is at most the diameter of h plus 2l, which is the upper bound we were trying to prove. Okay. So this says that we can, so, you know, the, the name, the names G and G prime and H and H prime are strategic. You know, we're going to be applying this where H is the largest um, component of the, in the erdos renyi process, or really it's minimum spanning tree. Um, and, uh, and then H prime is what is the, is the component you get after you've increased the, the parameter P a little bit. Okay. And so um, that's how we're going to bound the increase. Okay, so, um, so here's, um, here's the proposition that's going to follow from that, uh, from that key lemma. So if we take some epsilon tending to zero, uh, such that, so epsilon over n to the third tends to infinity, then the diameter of t, so three epsilon over two, minus the diameter, well, let me write it the same way as in the lemma, is at most the diameter of T epsilon plus order log epsilon cubed N over epsilon. Okay, so we're really thinking about, um, you know, here's the Here's our H prime, if you like. Here's our H. And then this error term is supposed to come from bounding the longest paths in what's, uh, what's outside. Okay. So, um, and this three epsilon over two from epsilon to three epsilon over two tells you how it is that we're going to step through the window that's left to cover between uh, epsilon you know, large constant n to the third and epsilon just a small constant, we're going to step through in geometric increases where you multiply by a factor of three halves at each step. Okay, so um, uh, the proof of this really, um, you know, boils down to facts about the uh, erdos renyi process plus this key lemma. So the key lemma tells us that um, uh, you know, as long as it's the case that H epsilon is contained in H three epsilon over two, right? That the largest components are actually nested in this way. That's needed for the lemma. We have to be growing the largest component. As long as that happens, then the diameter of that we're trying to bend. So at time three epsilon over two, is at most the diameter of T epsilon plus uh, twice the length of the longest path in a graph I'll call um, G, I'll just shorten it to G hat. What is this? No, first, maybe I'll do that in a second. So the graph we have to look at here is, uh, so the graph um, G N, so recall the notation, uh, so G, G epsilon is G N one plus epsilon over N. Okay, so the graph I have here is G three epsilon over two, but then restricted to the vertices um, that aren't part of the giant component H epsilon. I have to remove them. Uh, and then I have to um, uh, add one. Okay, so that's the bound that, uh, that the, um, key lemma tells me. And I'd like to call this graph uh, here um, uh, g hat um, for the rest of the proof, because epsilon is going to be sort of fixed for now. I don't need to carry it. Sorry about that. Uh, um, right. So, uh, so maybe a little picture is in order. Okay. Um, 
we've we've got our um, we've got our component h epsilon, right? We we think about removing it, and now there are all these other components of uh, so these are other components of of g epsilon, right? But then we um, then we increase epsilon, right? We increase the, the the value p from one plus epsilon over n to one plus three halves epsilon over n, and so some new edges come along and join up some of these components over here. Okay, and the way we're bounding the increase of the the, the increase in this diameter of t epsilon is to say, well, it's whatever we had before plus you know, however long a path might have been built outside of h epsilon in the meantime when we increased from epsilon to three epsilon over two. So we need to control what happens out here, not just after you remove h epsilon, but then also after you add some edges. And that's the only sort of subtlety to the, to the proof. Um, so, um, you know, the, the point is that we made this, we chose three halves here because it makes the picture outside of H epsilon still look subcritical. So these, so these bits won't have sort of agglomerated into too big of a component. Okay, and so let me explain the reason for that. So we know that um, when epsilon uh, over n to the third tends to infinity and epsilon is little o of one, then uh, the size of H epsilon is like two plus little o one in probability times epsilon n, right? So if I write um, n prime for n minus two epsilon n, okay, um, so that's n times one minus two epsilon, then this graph g hat, right? G hat is, um, so the percolation parameter is this one plus three epsilon over two over n, but the size of the remaining graph is basically like n prime, right? Because we removed h epsilon, which has size basically two epsilon n. Okay, so g hat looks roughly like a random graph. So with n prime vertices and parameter one plus three epsilon over two divided by n. Okay, which I can rewrite just using the definition of n prime as so one plus three epsilon on two times uh, one minus two epsilon, all divided by n prime. Okay, so here um, I'm uh, I'm using this deterministic size n prime as a proxy for the size of h epsilon, and I'm going to be a little bit casual about that. Uh, you know, in principle, I need to say that with high probability, h epsilon really has this behavior, but. Uh, but we sort of already saw the law of large numbers for this. So I'm just gonna, uh, you know, behave as though H epsilon behaves and really has size n prime uh, for explaining uh, for explaining how this diameter increase bound comes about. Okay. Um, so let's um, let's work out what this what this parameter here looks like now for the remaining graph G hat, right? Well, we have one plus uh, one plus three epsilon on two and then one minus two epsilon. So that looks like one minus epsilon on two plus uh, three quarters epsilon squared. Okay, so the dominant term when epsilon is small is one minus epsilon on two. And if, you know, certainly if n is large then this, um, and epsilon is tending to zero, then, you know, this is at most one minus epsilon on four, say. So the point is that what's what's left out here, even after we add these yellow edges, the edges that take us from epsilon to three epsilon over two, still looks like a subcritical random graph. Okay, it's not quite as subcritical. We got an epsilon over four out instead of a epsilon, um, but uh, but it's 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 subcritical. Okay, so now in the graph, you know. In a graph g n one minus epsilon over n, we know that the largest component size. So we have. 
size of C max is order log epsilon cubed n on uh, epsilon squared, which is in particular little o of epsilon n. Okay, we saw that before. And so that tells us that uh, with high probability, uh, well, actually, I don't, I don't, I don't need, um, I don't need more information about the size. I need information about the diameter. We just proved that in a graph like this, we have uh, diameter, a diameter bound uh, order log epsilon cubed n over epsilon uh, and surplus uh, at most one with high probability, right? And so that means that the um, the longest path in G hat, which looks like the longest path uh, in this graph G, so n prime one minus epsilon over four over n prime, right? Well, I'm I'm being generous here. Really, it's closer to one minus epsilon over two, but I'm 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 only looking for an upper bound, so. Um, so this, this longest path is sort of at most stochastically about the longest path in here. This looks like uh, order uh, log epsilon cubed n over epsilon, right? I mean, so I need a bound on the longest path and not the diameter, but if the surplus is at most one, then the diameter is at most, the length of the longest path is at most twice the, uh, the diameter. You can't sort of use each, there's, you, you know, you have to, you can use this one extra edge and then you have two paths which were paths in the original tree, each of which then has length at most the diameter of the, of the tree. Okay. Um, and so that tells me that, um, uh, well, um, right, so let's, let's back up. Where, where are we now? Um, we've said that, um, so on, uh, so, so when, uh, when the, when the largest components are nested like this, we got an upper bound, uh, which was precisely of the form that we wanted, right? We said that th this difference should be order log epsilon cubed n on epsilon, and that's uh, precisely what we got for the longest path, okay? Um, but now, um, uh, you know, the, the, event that, the event that we needed to happen has probability tending to one, right? When epsilon, uh, over n to the third tends to infinity, these, the largest components really are nested like this. So since, uh, so h epsilon is the subgraph of h three epsilon over two with high probability. Uh, the proposition follows. Okay, so, um, so we've shown that um, we've shown a bound on how much the um, the diameter increases when we go from epsilon to three epsilon over two, and note that the bound gets better as epsilon gets bigger, right? Because it's something uh, with a log epsilon on the top and an epsilon on the bottom. Okay. So now we'll we'll use that to finish this step A of bounding the the, the diameter increase when we go from constant over into the third to one over constant. Um, Maybe just before I, uh, I do that, let me mention, um, so this fact here, there's actually a stronger version of this known. So um, it's in fact, um, if you look at the probability that, so H epsilon, so that the giant, so once the leader, um, once this largest component emerges at, out of the critical window, its identity never changes. So the probability that H epsilon is contained in H epsilon prime for all um, you know, uh, epsilon less than epsilon prime uh, with, um, uh, so let me write it this way. Um, so for any, if epsilon over n to the third tends to infinity, then the probability that after, after time epsilon 
these com these largest components are always nested for for from then on forever, and this tends to one. Okay, so this is um, this is sometimes called the leader phenomenon. So once that once a leader emerges, it never changes. Okay, um, I I didn't really use that in the um, in the uh, proof of the proposition, but it's a nice fact. I thought I'd mention this is due to uh, Thomas Wuchak uh, from 1990. Okay. So now, having proved that, I think we can uh, we can sort of do the finishing stroke. So I want to um, I want to prove that if we have a function uh, omega n, which tends to to infinity arbitrarily slowly, then the diameter of t one on omega n minus the diameter of t at time omega n on n to the third is little o n to the third in probability. Okay, and this uh, this really f um, finishes the the step a. It gets you from large constant uh, over n to the third to small constant. Okay, so uh, so to prove this, we'll. Uh, We'll just take a sequence now of steps. So let epsilon i be uh, three halves to the i uh, times the starting value omega n over n to the third. Okay, and how many steps do we need? Well, log base three halves n to the third over omega uh, squared, because that's the the ratio of of these two terms. Um, so, um, uh, then epsilon, the last epsilon is, you know, somewhere between, um, one on omega n and three halves one on omega n, right? So it's basically, it's basically where we're targeting here. Okay. So then, um, you know, if, if H epsilon is contained in H epsilon prime, For all uh, epsilon epsilon prime bigger than um, uh, uh, I, omega, omega over n to the third here, right? So now I guess I am using this stronger fact that this happens for all um, for all of these values, right? Then the diameter difference between these times, so this difference that we're trying to bound. is going to be at most, so the sum from one to k of diameter of t at time epsilon i minus the diameter at time epsilon i minus one, okay, which we now know is at most, um, so uh, order, so sum for i from one to k of log of epsilon i cubed n over epsilon i. Okay, so um, so here is um, one more step where I'm being a little bit um, uncautious, right? Because I've just um, I have a bound for each of these sum ends. I have a bound of this form. Okay, so and and this order well order p log epsilon cubed n over epsilon. Okay, so I know that each of these sum ends individually is unlikely to be, you know, much bigger than this order. But there's more than a constant number of sum ends, right? So in theory, even if each one individually is unlikely to display some big, uh, some, some, some big fluctuation above this value, it might be that when you get lots of them, one of them is actually likely to fluctuate. So there's, there's a non-trivial step I'm not going to do that step, but there's a non-trivial step to, you know, actually prove tail bounds on these error probabilities, which are good enough that you can really take the, this um, this order outside of the summation. Okay, so that that's, um, you know, there's a sort of warning there. That to make this fully rigorous, you need to you need qu more quantitative control than I've showed you. Okay, but um, <clears throat> you know, 
if you're willing to, uh, to accept that, you know, our bounds on the diameter increase can be, um, can be combined in this way, then this gives us overall a bound just using the definition of the epsilon i, right? Three halves to the i omega n over n to the third, which is like n to the third and then sum from one to k uh, of log of three halves to the i omega n over um, three halves to the i omega n. Okay, and uh, you know this. Uh, this, these sum ends are geometrically decreasing, so they're um, they're dominated by their first uh, their first term, which is already sort of order log um, uh, log omega n over omega n. So this is order n to the third log omega n over omega n, and since omega is tending to infinity, that's little o of n to the third. Okay, so. Um, uh, so that, uh, I mean, really all that we're doing is stepping through the, um, the critical window in these steps, multiplicative steps of order three halves. And this three halves was just chosen less than two in order that when you aggregate, um, you know, what was outside with these extra edges, you're still left with something that looks subcritical enough to that the diameter keeps going down. Okay, so that's really, um, the whole idea of the proof. And then, um, you know, uh, so in this proposition, rather than taking a small constant here and a large constant here, I took something tending to zero here and tending to infinity here. Um, but really that's, that, that immediately implies the version with, um, you know, where you only want an order, um, order P in probability bound for n to the third. So if, um, you know, I'll just uh, state that as a corollary. So, you know, this implies that for any delta greater than zero, there's k such that the probability that t1 over k has diameter, um, so the difference in diameter between uh, time one over k and time k over n to the third is bigger than delta n to the third is less than delta. Okay, and the the proof is just is is just a very soft argument, right? If this if this failed, then you could extract a subsequence of of values so k tending to infinity, where you kept having uniformly positive probability of seeing uh, sort of positive constant n to the third difference between these two quantities, um, and the and the proposition rules that out. So if not, then taking subsequences. contradicts the proposition. Okay, so we've now seen that, um, you know, uh, we've now seen all the pieces. We saw that the diameter at uh, time k over n to the third is order n to the third. Right? We saw that the diameter at time one over k is at most order n to the third bigger than it was at time k over n to the third. Right, And then the last piece uh, was using Prim's algorithm. We saw that the diameter of the minimum spanning tree minus the diameter at time one over k is in fact much smaller order log squared n, right? And so just telescoping these together um, gives uh, gives the bound that we were aiming for. Okay, so if you want to. Um, I'm just going to say one or two more words um, before um, wrapping up. I know I'm at uh, time already, um, but uh, so this, you know, this controls the diameter of, this was our upper bound to match the lower bound, okay? Um, we now know the diameter is typically of order into the third, 
Um, if you want to get your hands on the structure of this tree in more detail, this also told us that effectively, you know, we now know that in some sense, the minimum spanning tree is roughly structured like the tree T at time large constant over n to the third. Okay. So you could think about trying to understand this tree directly to get a better handle on the structure of the minimum spanning tree. Okay. And one way to do that is to take the, the this is the minimum spanning tree of the largest component H K over n to the third. Okay. And these large components, we actually understood their structure. They look like, they look like these kernels, these random three regular graphs, okay, with random edge lengths, and then with some sort of decorations. Okay, and this, and if you start to think about the minimum span entry of this object, it actually really is the the best or the only way I know to understand the kind of structure of the minimum span entry in finer detail. And the way you do that is using the cycle breaking algorithm that we saw. So starting from this picture, you can imagine starting to remove large weight edges rather than add uh, small, small weight edges, okay? And you only remove edges if they break cycles in the cycle breaking process. And so we'll only actually remove edges that lie on this core that we built, okay? And then the nice distributional properties of the core that we sort of saw that these edge lengths are exchangeable and we have sort of explicit distributional dis descriptions allow you to kind of get your hands on on the behavior of cycle breaking on this graph and so understand the minimum span entry in more detail. Okay and in some sense it actually tells you if you think about that that the minimum that the complete graph is not the the sort of single most natural object to study the minimum span entry on. In a way, the most natural object to study the minimum spanning tree on in the mean field is a random three regular graph rather than a complete graph. And not even just a random three regular graph, but a random three regular graph with random edge lengths corresponding to this core. Because if you do that, then there's a self similarity when you do, you get an object where if you take this graph and kind of do critical percolation on it, you get another object of the same kind, just a smaller version. And that self similarity can actually be bootstrapped to prove um, that the minimum spanning tree of a random three regular graph looks sort of the same as the minimum spanning tree of a complete graph. So we've used that approach in, uh, in some other work. Um, okay, so that's about all I'm gonna say on global structure, but I think I've given you a sort of pretty good idea of how one approaches the global structure. There's still lots of models where it would be nice to know that this same story works uh, where we don't. Uh, but I won't talk about those. I'll talk, I'm going to focus in on the local structure for Thursday and Friday, describe the local limit of the minimum spanning tree and prove the, um, the, uh, the, the um, law of large numbers for the total weight of the minimum spanning tree. Thanks.